Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning for um, today's webinar, Selecting the Right Tools and Strategies for New or Reluctant uh, re Writers. Um, this webinar is hosted by Florida's Adult and Family Literacy Resource Center, a program of the Florida Literacy Coalition. And this webinar has been made possible through the support of the Florida Department of Education, Division of Career and Adult Education. Um, before we get started, I'd like to show you a little bit um, about your webinar tools. So if you direct your attention to the panel on your right hand side, um, this is going to be your control panel. Uh, on the top of your control panel, at, on the left hand side, you'll see a red arrow key. If you click this red arrow key, it will dock your panel. Uh, if you'd like to put it away during the presentation, uh, you just have to click that arrow key to pull it back out. Um, beneath that, you're going to see a, a little hand icon. This is going to be your hand raise icon. If prompted to raise your hand, you're going to click that button. So, for instance, I'll say something like, um, if you can hear me, please raise your hand. So when I say that, you just click that little hand icon. Can everyone hear me? Looks like people can hear me because they are raising their hands. Perfect. All right. Um, now, for the question for the hand raise icon, we actually don't use that to um, try and ask questions um, like you normally would in a classroom. Uh, in order to do to ask questions, you're going to go to the questions box. Uh, on your main control panel. So there you'll see that you can type in a question. So if you have a question for um, Jamie, our presenter today, or you have a question for me, you can go ahead and type that in the box. I'll be monitoring the questions. So all, if you have any technical questions, if you type it into that box, I can answer it and send it to you privately. If you're asking a question about content, Jamie will uh, answer it for, um, answer it uh, on the line and so everyone can hear the answer. Um, next is the polls. Um, throughout the webinar, you will be instructed to participate in a short poll, uh, in some short polls. Um, this is pretty simple. It'll just pop up on your screen after we ask the question, and uh, you'll just be prompted to uh, click the answer that uh, you feel is best. Um, last, there are handouts on your main control panel. So you'll see a couple of handouts right there. There's the FL, FL Lit Write Tools. That's going to be the uh, your main handout. Um, and then there's a links handout with all the links uh, to resources that Jamie will discuss, plus some additional. All right. So with that said, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, uh, Jamie Adelson uh, Goldstein. Um, she is an ESOL professional development specialist, curriculum consultant, and author, and facilitates face-to-face -face and online teacher education for U.S. and international adult education agencies. She's been, uh, she's been a featured speaker and a keynote at numerous adult education conferences and is the co-author of Oxford Picture Dictionary 3E and series director of Step Forward 2E. So with that, I would like to go ahead and hand this over to Jamie. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. Uh, it's a little earlier in the morning for me than it is for you, but I, I hope you can tell me through time travel that uh, today is a lovely day and I hope the holiday crunch is making, bringing you more joy than aggravation. Uh, along the, the lines of more joy and less aggravation, today we're talking about the tools that and strategies that can really help not only our learners, but, uh, but us as well as, as writers. I want to thank so many of you for uh, completing the poll, the survey that uh, we sent out. We didn't have enough of a survey to make uh, statements about the group. Uh, so what I'd like you to, uh, to do, if you wouldn't mind, is uh, raise your hand if you are working with, and this is you know, the raise your hand uh, tool that Nicole mentioned to you. Raise your hand if you're working with only one learner at a time. And Nicole, if you can help me see that, that would be great. Or at least give me a count. Sure, no problem. It's just not up on mine. One thing that did come up 
I saw while you're you're uh, raising your hands, um, I'll just tell you one thing that did come up as uh, you know with the group that that filled out the survey were some of the words that you associate with writing, and I wanted to share those with you because they they categorize themselves very nicely. Um, if you notice on the left hand side, these are more affective words, um, concepts of inspiration and clarity. The word paper is a little more concrete, um, but that. You know, writing uh, elicits these types of terms from you. On the other side is uh, perhaps the more instructional aspect of writing, um, the fact that we need to supply prompts and vocabulary, that we support our learners with standard English usage, and the, you see structure comments there and punctuation. Um, it's really interesting to me because uh, so many of you that fill this out, obviously already have a really strong handle on the writing process, which is something we're gonna focus on today. Nicole, do we have a count on the number of people that are working with one learner? Yeah, it looks like we have a small amount here that have raised their hands. We have three people who have raised their hands. Okay, so um, then can we, do, can we take away that, yep. uh, that count? And could we get a count for those of you that are working with groups of 10 or more students? And then we'll go on. I'll let you continue to raise your hand for that one. Okay. That one we seem to have a lot more. Okay, well then this is the, uh, what we do today about is 10. going to be very, about 10? Okay. Yeah. So that's leaving us so about 13 people who are somewhere in between that group, <laughs> which is a perfect multi-level setting and suits us just, it, just the way it should in adult education. We are never just homogeneous. We are a heterogeneous divergent group. What I'd like you to think about is what are your goals uh, in teaching writing? Are you hoping to help your learner generate ideas? Are you hoping to help your learners uh, organize their thoughts, communicate their ideas clearly, tell a good story, construct an effective argument, find their voices? Um, and in many cases, writing is a great way to find your voice in the new language if you're working with English language uh, learners. So let's take a look at what kind of writing you do, and then we'll think about it in terms of what kind of writing our adult learners need to do. Here's that poll that uh, Nicole mentioned. It's gonna come up in a minute. Okay, it's up now. Thank you. So if you would select one or more of the following that you do regularly. And I don't know if Pamela Joe is on this um, webinar, but if you are, Pamela Joe, I know that, that you will definitely be uh, hitting number two because I got a tweet from you this morning. Okay, so um, we'll probably give it another um, about 15 seconds. Okay. Some more people. One of the great, oh, sorry. One of the great things about working in adult education is that we can be, to some degree, uh, a good gauge of what it is adults need to do in their daily lives. And the kinds of kind of writing that we do is very likely the kind of writing that our learners are going to need to do. Now, granted, we may not be planning on going into post-secondary ed and writing papers, but we have to write materials that support the work that we're doing as instructors. So the type of academic or workplace writing that we do is uh, important for us to consider. Nicole, I did not see the results of the poll. Yep, I'm gonna go ahead and share those results right oh, now. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so let's look at, we are list makers and outliners and planners. Um, that's definitely something that's uh, in my, my sphere as well. And we are doing a lot of personal correspondence and social media posts. Um, about a third of the responses said that business or academic writing. And we know that for our learners, especially as they're progressing in, in uh, post-secondary training, as well as any kind of additional uh, academic work, they're going to be facing this a lot. Um, short personal narratives, maybe not as much. Um, and longer narratives and poetry is certainly ranked down a little bit lower, but that doesn't mean we're not doing it. Uh, and we do want to give our learners an opportunity to express themselves along those lines. Not everything has to be informational text. 
but we do want to make sure that we're providing as much support for the areas where they're going to be doing the most writing. And happily, with writing, listing, outlining, planning is a huge part of writing effectively. So if we help our learners with that kind of writing, we're going to help them with the writing on all the other um, elements below. Okay, so if we can end that poll, Nicole, thank you. I thought it might be useful for you to have this, and by the way, um, you have on the front of your handout, you have, well, I'm gonna actually show it to you in a minute, but a link to a Google folder. And the reason that I wanted to give you a Google folder with additional materials is that some of these things you'll wanna share with your learners, especially if you're in a classroom setting. Um, if you're in a tutorial setting, you may choose to show this on your phone or, or, or show bits and pieces of what I'm sharing with you today. But this particular set of quotes um, is is really a beautiful window into why people write. And I think it's some complex text that you may want to share with your learners. Uh, Zadie Smith says, writing is my way of expressing and thereby eliminating all the various ways we can be wrongheaded. Juno Diaz says, it's a way for me to address and counter my questions about what it means to be human, or in my case, a Dominican human who grew up in New Jersey. Flannery O'Connor wrote, I write because I don't know what I think until I read what I say. Zhao Xing Zhang said, I, I have how to pronounce that. I don't think I did it right. Um, writing eases my suffering. Writing is my way of reaffirming my own existence. And this is something that I think our learners can certainly relate to. Gloria E. Anzaldua says, by writing, I put order in the world, give it a handle so I can grasp it to discover myself, to preserve myself, to make myself, to achieve self-autonomy. And once again, this is something that I think our learners can definitely relate to. But what do we do about the learner who is new to writing, new to writing in English, reluctant about writing? And from what I saw in the survey of a few of you, some of you have some of that response. Uh, uh, a couple of people wrote about the difficulty of writing. So we want to help our learners address their fears about writing. And for us to do that in this hour time frame is maybe a little ambitious. So this is a link, and this link is, um, is in the handout as well. Uh, this is a link to a Google folder, and I'm going to show you that Google folder right now so you can see what it would look like. I hope I was going to show it to you. <laughs> there we go. Because I want you to know what you'll be looking at. So you'll see something that will come up like this and, and you'll have the, the first two handouts from uh, the most recent webinars on writing that were done on feedback and also on uh, engaging them with evidence-based writing instruction, as well as this Teal Handbook, which is uh, an exceptional resource on writing instruction. So there are some other tools in here, and I want to make sure that you're aware that what we cover today is really a launching pad towards the tools and strategies that you'll want to employ when you're teaching new and reluctant writers. Needs assessment is probably one of the most essential elements of any type of adult instruction. Frankly, I think it's essential for all instruction, but particularly with adults, because our adults do not come in as blank slates. And the same is, of course, said, can be said of you. So I'm going to ask you to take a look at this poll and indicate what you can already do. And this is an anonymous poll. Please yes. answer um, as honestly, because again, you know, whether you can or can't do these things, uh, we're going to be covering them and at least somewhat covering them. And hopefully by the end, you'll have a better sense of them. We should, okay, so we'll give we should it have a, 
we're almost at a hundred, you know, percent voted. So let's just give it maybe another 10 seconds. Perfect. No pressure, everybody. Okay, we still have a few people finishing up. Okay. I would sing to you, but that would really not be nice. <laughs> I I once was on a flight where the flight attendant, because we were circling New York, thought it would be a really good idea for her to sing Christmas carols over the PA. Okay, um, so I'll go ahead and share that now, if that's all right with you, Jamie? Please. Okay. So more than half of you are very familiar with the stages of the writing process, and that's terrific, and I hope you will forgive the review, but we have uh, a little under 40% who could use um, an introduction to that and we'll make use of that. Uh, we will then guide our discussion of the strategies and tools through each stage of the writing process. Um, I think it's wonderful that 71% of you are aware of visual thinking strategies. I'm gonna share those questions today and perhaps we can think about whether these are the same types of questions that you ask uh, your learners. Models and frames, it looks like half of you are in there as well. We're going to talk about how do we create models and frames using materials that are already out there, uh, particularly the essay book. Uh, checklists and rubrics, looks like, again, more than half of you are very familiar with this. And we'll talk about where those strategies may be found online. Uh, and smartphone resources, maybe not as many. Uh, so it looks like that's not something that's as uh, well um, as well known, and we are going to be touching on that today. I want to really stress the importance of the smartphone as a computer tool in, in tutorial and classroom settings. Uh, it's, it gives the learner access. It's a little harder to type on a, on a smartphone, but there are some wonderful other tools that we can use. Thank you so much, Nicole. So many of you uh, according to the poll, are very familiar with the writing process. For those of you that are not, however, let's just take a look at it because it's going to be the framework uh, within which we discuss the tools and strategies for writing. So starting with pre-writing, which I know many of you know, um, even if you don't know the writing process, you know the importance of starting with planning, gathering ideas, and planning. So that whole process of gathering ideas, planning and organizing, we're going to talk about the tools and strategies we can use. You'll notice that the next stage is drafting. And you can see that the arrow between pre-writing and drafting has what we call a gradient, meaning that the colors merge. Um, drafting and pre-writing, the learner must be prepared to go back and forth because uh, in good writers examine their draft and see whether it's really going in the direction that they wanted, and maybe in some cases they have to go back, gather some more ideas, do a, uh, some different planning. And since so many of you enjoy the planning aspect of writing, this is probably not a big stretch for you. We wanna be sure that learners are creating more than one draft in cases where they're going to be doing a, um, writing that is um, more expanded. When we're talking about a quick write or we're talking about something that is really more of a practice writing activity, one draft is fine. The revising process, again, has that arrow back and forth, as you can see. So it's very possible that when a learner starts to revise, they have to go back and do another draft. And that whole idea of rev revision is based more on content and organization than it is on uh, grammatical structure or maybe even word choice. Um, we're really talking about, as long as the, the words convey the content, we're not as interested in changing that at the revision stage, but we are interested in making sure that the story is getting across, the concept is getting across, the argument is getting across, whatever the purpose of the writing is. And in order to do that, we want learners to get peer feedback, we want them to be able to respond to that feedback, and we want them to get some teacher feedback at that time. The difference between revising and editing, 
I'll point out um, more as we go forward. But the editing is where we are really talking about looking at the structure, the mechanics, and the word choice of the text. So revising is really more um, the idea side of things, and editing is making sure that everything is in place. And then we're going to finalize, which is going to be the actual writing of the polished copy. And the finalizing of writing can have more to do with formatting. Um, it can have to do with keyboarding, and it can, and it definitely is preparing the writing for making being made available to a, a wider audience. The publishing aspect. Most of the time, in most of the writing we do in our classes, we're probably going to get as far as the revision side. We may get into editing on a more um, holistic way of looking at editing, but we're, we're really not going all the way through the, the writing process. In order to get through the writing process, you need to devote time. And so that might be that that's a, a three week, over a period of three weeks, we're, we're meeting and we're working on the writing. That's not exclusive to all the other things we're working on, but we're giving it that kind of time frame. Excuse me, I'm going to mute myself. Okay, take a moment and just jot down on a piece of paper next to you or using your fingers, count off the stages of the writing process. I'm going to give you 10 seconds. Check yourself. Did you get all six stages? The one that most often gets missed when I ask people to do this in a face-to-face -face workshop is the finalizing. So let's look at the tools and strategies for each of these stages, uh, some of which are going to be tech and some of which are going to be no tech. Before we can think about the tools we need, again, we need to think about the needs of the learner. So what are some skills that learners need at this stage? They need to be able to brainstorm effectively. Um, that means that they don't stop themselves in the middle of a brainstorm, that they brainstorm with a lot of quantity. They're, they can always go back and look at the quality of the ideas, but you want them to be able to generate a lot of ideas, words, um, images, whatever it is that you're asking them to brainstorm. They need to be able to formulate questions because the questions will help guide their writing. They need to be able to see things in the mind's eye. So they need to be able to envision what it is that they're going to try to recount. If they're, if they're just doing a paragraph describing a friend, they need to pull that friend's image up. From the planning and organizing side, they need to be able to sequence information, rank information, and make use of graphic organizers. This is just allowing you to think through it again. Trying to generate topics can be problematic, but um, I know that several of you, if not all of you, are thinking about, and I hope will decide to, have your learners participate in the Florida Literacy Coalition 2018 essay. Uh, and this, that essay um, book is a phenomenal resource. It's also a phenomenal resource before it's printed because it gives you a whole set of topics to work from. Uh, these are some of the topics, these are the topics that are uh, proposed for the 2018 edition. And then of course, there's also the option of writing a personal narrative or producing original poetry. So one of the first things you can do when you're looking for, uh, you and your learner are looking for topics is to take a look at the topics that are already provided for you in an essay contest of this, um, of this type. You can also look at your textbooks and see the different content areas and have the students choose which content area is of interest to them to write about. In order to generate content or topics beyond something that's already provided for them, um, you, may, you may want to 
find things that you bring into the classroom. And uh, these links, again, are provided for you on the link page that Nicole put um, in the handouts. Uh, they're also live in the PowerPoint that you have as well um, on the Google Drive. I'm going to give you a, a quick view of the creative writing prompts and the edutopia prompts right now. Oops. Edutopia is a, a phenomenal resource. It is K-12 oriented, but the many of the writing prompts are appropriate, especially if you go to the high school level. Uh, you can see a lot of great prompts. Um, here are the high school prompts. Uh, do Americans have it too easy? Why do you think that? What causes racism? So here are a number of, of high level thinking prompts that you can start with brainstorming from uh, just to start the creative juices flowing. This 365 creative writing prompts and uh, the Think Written site also has um, a wonderful selection. I mean, for 365, you could even start off uh, each class or session with your learner or learners um, by asking a question that comes from here. Now, you may want to obviously edit these so that they're more appropriate to your learners, but it's a place for us as teachers to go to. And then we can always direct our learners here as well. This is, a, a, I think, one of my favorite types of prompts. I like to talk about emotions uh, a lot when I'm starting students with writing. Um, love is a great place to go. Fear is a good one as well. So many of you wrote that you're very familiar with the visual uh, uh, thinking strategies. And I don't know if, if some of you have been to my session on this, but um, I have found that this is a tremendous uh, it's a tremendous boon for learners with limited English proficiency because they have a reaction to images and it's acknowledging the, the higher level thinking that, that our learners have, but also helping them generate what they already see and then building on what they want to be able to say about what they see. So having learners respond to the question, how does the image make you feel, um, is a great way to start. Then having them just list, as I say, what they see, but from that, categorizing what they see gives them a place to to hang their ideas and then we can start talking about their drawing their uh, drawing conclusions and making inferences those last two the the first two are really kind of circle the answer um, or write the individual word which is not a bad way to start for our learners of just um, generating brainstorming off the picture the drawing conclusions and the making inferences we can be in the oral mode, but we can also give our learners time to write their ideas because again, kind of like Flannery O'Connor said, sometimes you don't know what you think until you write it. For those of you who have uh, relatives or have served in the military, thank you so much for your service. This is a, uh, a photo that I think evokes a lot of emotion and is something that I could use on a theme of homecoming. Uh, if I wanted learners to write about what is home for them or family, there's so many things that I could use this photo as a, an opening prompt. But then I you know, would use my questions as I showed earlier. And ideally, um, you would turn to a partner right now and talk about what your responses are to these questions. But because we're in the world of cyberspace, um, I'm going to imagine that you are talking to yourself and giving the, the answers to these questions to yourself right now. But again, remember, you'll have this available to you uh, online to, to use with your, with your colleagues and with your learners. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to, gener to write questions in the, uh, the question window. In order to generate content or topics, again, we talked about brainstorming and the need to brainstorm effectively. Um, sometimes uh, learners can, they get a little hogtied by having to write their brainstorm. Um, a couple of ways, if you're in a classroom setting, a couple of ways I do that is have a corners activity uh, and you can have um, learners take turns writing things on a, a tear sheet or you can have one learner recording other learners' ideas. 
but you can also use a smartphone. Uh, students can record their ideas just uh, putting up the notes application and clicking the microphone, uh, which comes up when you put up the keyboard. So that's just something to be aware of, having students record. You can, they can also obviously videotape their brainstorm, but that's probably using a little bit too much battery power. In order for them to think about the topic more deeply, uh, they need to be able to generate questions. A uh, Wheel Decide is a, a terrific tool for just spinning for all kinds of random uh, ways of, of uh, creating a random experience. But in this case, I have populated the wheel, and I'll show you the wheel right now. I've populated the wheel with, uh, with WH questions. And I spin the wheel, and I can ask a how question about the photo that I just showed. You know, how long has she been away? Um, or what I can do that's more meaningful for the learners is ask them to generate a question because that's what we really want. We want that inquiry process. By the same token, I can have. Uh, learners do clustering and mapping tasks that also help them brainstorm and generate questions at the same time. Oops, sorry. And I can also use uh, KWL charts that have the learners identify what they already know about a topic and what they want to know about a topic. So that's more in the questioning vein of preparation. Also having learners draw out what they are thinking about. So in the case of a process, or being able to visualize, in this case, the things that I like. Um, we, we don't value the drawing process as much as we maybe should in our classes. Many of our learners are very visual. For those that are not, they can just populate it with words, and it can be words from their first language, because at this point, we're about generating ideas. When we get to the idea, the, the next stage of pre-writing, where we're organizing those ideas, graphic organizers are, um, they're our gift. So if we're doing a compare and contrast, we're using a Venn diagram like you see on the left. If we're doing uh, any kind of a process or narrative, we can provide learners with a sequencing or chain of events graphic organizer. And this leads us over to the drafting stage. So the drafting, the drafting stage of the lesson, as I mentioned, we want to create one or more drafts. We want the learner to be aware that they may not just write one draft. But in order for them to really be able to start drafting, they need to be able to verbalize their ideas. They need to be able to tell the story that they want to tell to themselves. And this is something that Steven Spielberg talks about in his book uh, on writing, is that the very first time you write, you're telling what it is you want to say to yourself. It isn't until you start revising that you're telling it to someone else. They need to be able to make a claim if that's the direction the writing is going. They need to be able to describe if that's the kind of writing they want to do, or compare, or talk about a process. So those, those skills we have to pay attention to in the drafting process in order to scaffold for the learner so they can produce a draft that at least is allowing them to show these skills. I want to share with you, this uh, comes from the, the Teaching Excellence in Adult Learning uh, resource that I sh showed you in on the Google folder. And I'll read this for those of you that may not be able to see it. Struggling writers often have weak content area vocabulary and prior knowledge. So that we're talking now about the reluctant writer, the one who's struggling. Scaffold with them and help them grow their own funds of knowledge and experience. Make explicit analogies from their lives and work. Create lists and webs of words and ideas generated in class and keep these lists and reference materials visible during the writing phases so learners can use them. So what we want to be sure that learners have at hand are the materials that they've generated in the pre-writing. And the pre-writing cannot be undervalued, and we need to spend as much time on the pre-writing as possible in order to get the learners able to draft. 
So here are some ways to help the learner get through the first part of drafting. Maybe suggest they start at the end of their story or of their essay or of their claim. What is it that they want the reader to learn or understand? Take the graphic organizer information and just put it into sentences. Work from a model, many of you have already said, I think 70 some percent of you have said that you are very familiar with the idea of working from a model. Models can come from authentic materials. Obviously, if you're looking at writing a business email, you want to look at an authentic business email. Um, if you are looking at essays, you want to look at probably student essays uh, so that they can see the quality of work that they're going to, that they're aspiring to. You're not necessarily looking initially at a very uh, big, uh, sorry, at a very complex text, uh, an, an essay done by somebody who's writing at a much higher level than the learners. That's different if we're talking about reading. If we're talking about reading, we want to attack that complex text. But when we're talking about writing and we're trying to scaffold for the newer reluctant writer, we want to show a model that the learner can achieve. And in that way, we could even look at our ESL textbook models because a lot of the newer ESL textbooks are providing models that still have uh, higher level thinking and some complex structure or vocabulary, but they're again at an attainable level. We want to complete frames, help them complete frames or use sentence stems. So again, not cheating, scaffolding, so that they're learning the habit of good academic writing or good business writing or the correct way to introduce an idea or to conclude a paragraph. This last one is a little tricky, but you can use it. Um, it's to create sequenced questions and that the answers to the questions produce the paragraph. In some cases, this can be very inauthentic writing, but if you write the paragraph, a model paragraph first, and then look and see what questions would, would actually elicit the sentences you've written, then you'll get a better idea of how you can support this process with your learners. As I mentioned earlier with the brainstorming, learners can start drafting using their smartphone voice notes. So you'll see I've, I've indicated this is an iPhone, but it's very similar on an Android. I've indicated that where the microphone is and they just click on that and they start speaking. Of course, there will be issues where the Siri or you know, whatever device is, let's say Google Voice is listening and will misinterpret, but they can also look down below. Let me see if I can show you this. Make sure you see it. At this section, there will be suggested prompts for words. So if this also gives them, um, it, it can be ignored or it's something they can use as a scaffolding tool. They can go back in then uh, on the iPhone now, and I'm, I'm fairly sure, I looked it up, but I couldn't find confirmation that they could go in on Androids as well and annotate or highlight the text. This means also that you can send learners material that they could import into notes and they could annotate and do activities right on their cell phones. Trying to, to uh, if the I know it. Nicole told me I have to go back to pointer. This is an example of a textbook that is providing the model and the frame. Um, it's this is from Step Forward. So, you know, as Nicole mentioned, this is a book that I'm intimately involved with. But the reason that I show this is because it has a very specific flow to what I'm explaining. The idea that learners are first given a model, then they're given a frame that follows the model. And when they complete that, at this, this is a beginning level, when they complete that, they have a piece of writing. Notice that we also are, um, we wanna make sure that lear learners have the formatting that they need, the information they need about structure or punctuation. And in this case, this writer's note tells the learner that they have to put in a comma when they're uh, using the date written out in this way. This is an example from last year's uh, essay book and I chose it because I think that first paragraph is is fairly simple basic compared to how mo much more complex the rest of the the text gets but this is a great example of material that you can use in a multi-level way so 
I take that first paragraph and I create a frame from that first paragraph. And I know that there are certain things that will have to change. For example, someone may not have any children uh, or someone uh, may have just one child. So I'm going to provide the pronouns. I may not have to do that for, a, and I hopefully wouldn't have to do it for higher level learners. I'd ask them to go through and they would identify the frame. They could, could highlight the words that would not be necessary um, or, or the, the words that they would be changing for their own story. And you can see down at the bottom here, uh, this is the link you can get, and this is on your links page as well. Uh, you can get access to all the essay books from the past in PDF form, and you can print out with PDFs, you can print out a single page, or you can print out the whole book. I recommend the single page. So now that we've drafted, and again, you know, we are we are moving through this rather swiftly, <laughs> but now that we've drafted, we're in a place for it where the learners need strategies and tools. We need strategies and tools to help them revise, edit, and proofread. But what's the difference between those three? When you're revising, you're looking at it again. You're trying to be sure the message is getting across. You're looking at the way ideas are organized and supported. And I think learners need to understand that's what this stage is. And that's why they go back to drafting after revising. They're not necessarily always ready to go to the editing place. So when you're revising, you're really making sure that what it, you wanted to say is coming through. Granted, sometimes grammar, word choice, structure will stand in the way of what you want to say. And if that's all that's standing in the way, then you can go to editing. But if you really aren't making, if the organization of the piece is really awkward or you're not really coming to any conclusion, then as a writer, you need to go back and redraft or revise. Uh, in editing, you're ensuring that the wording is specific, descriptive, concise, and accurate. So that's really where we're talking about looking at the focus on form. With proofreading, that's where you're finalizing. You Before you go to type up that final piece or handwrite or print that very, uh, that paper that you're going to share with the world, that's where you're making sure that what you typed is accurate in terms of the spelling, um, the mechanics, uh, and if there are any fragments. That's something to, that, that you'd wanna look at. And that happens a lot with me these days as I'm typing and my mind travels to someplace else, and I think I finished that sentence, but in fact, have not. So let's look again at the skills our learners would need for revision. They have to be able to gather feedback and clarify. They have to value that feedback, an issue with peer feedback sometimes. They have to be able to transition to writing for an audience. So I understand, I, I remember this so well. <laughs> when I was working on my first textbook with Oxford. And I had written a listening lesson, and I understood how that lesson was going to be taught. I had taught it, and I knew it worked. But what I had written hadn't been uh, comprehensible to someone else reading it. And so I had to go back in and rewrite, which is kind of miserable. But I did it, and, and that's what writers have to do. So to be aware that transitioning to writing for an audience means potentially rewriting. And then that plays right into persistence and the growth mindset. And those of you that know about Carol Dweck and the growth mindset know that as opposed to a fixed mindset that says, once I start making a lot of mistakes, I've reached the, the end of my intelligence and I can go no further. A growth mindset says, these mistakes, these failures are part of my path to success. I use these failures as a, a way to grow. And I recognize that failures actually build uh, neural pathways and that my synapses are connecting every time I fail. That whole growth mindset is so key to writing uh, because a fixed mindset and a red pen have dissuaded so many people from being able to express themselves uh, in writing. So we want to set up opportunities for peer editing. Now, since only three of you identified yourselves as working with individual learners, maybe some of you listening to the recording are working one-on-one, -on -one, it's, it's okay for you to be the person that gives your learner feedback. But in a tutorial setting, you really want 
someone who's in the same writing boat as sure. your learner if possible to give feedback as well. Uh, so I would suggest that if you can pair up, if you're in a library, if you can pair up with other tutor learner pairs uh, and have an opportunity for peer feedback, maybe using Skype or Zoom. Uh, and again, this is a little digital world, but it's, it's uh, very gratifying. And I know a number of us have been working in Florida, have been working uh, on Zoom. So this is, uh, they're, they're basically video conferencing platforms. Um, you can certainly do it through email, uh, through text messaging. All of that's possible as well if you have individual learners. Um, but that's something you would have to set up through your program. Obviously, in a class, it's a lot um, simpler in terms of pairing learners and having them read each other's material. But you still have to provide checklists so that the learners have a guide to how they are to provide peer feedback. Here's an example of one type of checklist. It's very simple, um, just asking them to talk about how they felt when they read it. Again, we're sort of at the, uh, the visual thinking strategies place, but having an emotional response. Having the learner have a space where he or she can write his or her own response and perhaps in his or her first language is, is a great add to this kind of checklist. Then you want to give your, uh, if you want the learners to know what to focus on, you want to give them a, some kind of checklist. Here's one example. It can be much simpler than this as well. Um, did you understand every sentence? Uh, what is the best, what's the most interesting sentence? Uh, what's a sentence you have a question about? You know, that could be that kind of, that's not a checklist as much as a, a fill in the a blank. Making sure that the learners have an opportunity to write back their feedback is also terrific. And of course, uh, stays within the theme of writing skill development. So providing a, uh, a frame for their report back to, their, uh, to the author is a great way for them to continue this feedback process. And I love that last line, I could help you with. Because that gives the learner who's reading agency. Now, when it comes to our feedback, it's so easy to get stuck in the grammar place. And we want really to think in terms of, again, content and organization and clarity. So in this particular uh, rubric that, I've, that I'm going to use as a teacher, I've decided that I want to focus on evidence as well as content, organization, and clarity because the learner is making a claim in this text that I'm reading. But if it, if it were a story, I wouldn't probably put evidence. Maybe I'd put descriptions. So this is called a one-point rubric, and I think it's a tremendous boon to our field because it really, instead of the five-point rubric that tells you um, the very best and the very worst you could be <laughs> in different dimensions, this is telling you in these dimensions, content, organization, clarity, and evidence, here's the criteria that I'm looking for, Here's where you did really well. Here's where I'm concerned. So for example, um, in this case with this reading, the student did, a, you know, met the criteria and chose a really interesting topic. So I comment on that. In organization, I'm seeing some trouble there. So I'm asking a question. In clarity, I don't think the conclusion in this text is as clear as it could be. So I'm, I'm writing that, to that, that note to them. And then in terms of evidence, I see that the student has, you know, has put in details and facts that support the main idea. So this is a way for me to give feedback to the student, but notice it's, we're not talking about going through with, um, you know, my careful editing of every gram grammatical error, which there will be, <laughs> because we all make them. So that brings us to the editing stage. And this is where I imagine most of us have had some of our hardest uh, emotional moments with our learners writing because maybe we've looked at something and said, wow, these ideas are so good. 
but how do I make, how do I help the learner make these clear with the language forms that they are um, murdering? <laughs> and, and I think that one of the very first things we have to do is acknowledge that if the ideas are clear, then we want to focus on specific grammatical and mechanical errors and try to focus on one or two of those per writing assignment, if we can. Sometimes there are too many things facing us. But in order for this to really work, the skill our learner needs is to be able to notice grammatical and mechanical errors. And it's really hard to notice uh, a plethora. But if you're asking for a learner to focus on one or two things, that is doable. And again, remember the writing process. So it could be that the learner goes back and revises, and, and then we, in the editing process, we go to another set of, of grammatical errors, as long as the learner understands it's a process. The ability of the learner to use feedback and grammar guides to correct errors is very important because we want autonomy. We don't want to be, we can't be next to the learner at all times. So we want them to have tools they can use to correct their own grammar and to uh, increase the specificity and, and the descriptive quality of their writing. We want them to be able to employ appropriate punctuation and to use feedback, word lists, or thesauruses to, thesauri, <laughs> to, to improve their word choice. So let's take a look at each of those one more time. And this is where the tools can, can really, um, really play, the tech tools can really play an important part. Macmillan Dictionary is a wonderful resource. Um, it has a thesaurus as well, uh, the thesaurus.com. Um, and uh, word processing tools. Uh, you know, these, these will give learners a lot of information. I'm sure it's a little hard for you to see. Let's see if I made this go larger. No, I didn't. That would have been too easy. Uh, <laughs> uh, when you look at word processing, and I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this in your own writing, when you use the spell checker, or very often if you, if you use something called Grammarly.com, it will actually uh, do things in real time online for you, indicating with red wiggly lines whether something is misspelled, indicating with a blue wiggly line whether something is structurally uh, problematic, and a green wiggly line talking about a grammar issue. So I think knowing these different tools is a very uh, important strategy for our learners. So the strategies that we want to give them and you notice that the, you know, the visual to the right, is to have them use self-editing che checklists before you give feedback on editing. So ideally, in order to help them start to notice errors, we have to let them look for them first. That doesn't mean they're gonna find them. We know they won't find them because we read what we expect to see. And, and if it makes sense to us, that's very likely means we're not gonna see the error. We can ask our learners to read things aloud but depending on their familiarity with the cadence, they may not be able to pick up errors in, in English. So having them use the self editing new checklist and having them read their material aloud before you look at it is very key at the editing stage. When you look at it, focus on one paragraph and then identify errors in that paragraph that you want to focus on. Maybe it's a tense error that you want to focus on. Maybe, maybe at the very lowest level, it's just the mechanical error of capitalization. Whichever error it is you focus on in that paragraph or errors, have the learner apply that same information to subsequent paragraphs. And as I mentioned, see if you can focus on one error at a time. And then, of course, lose the red pen. If you can avoid using red, it's terrific. You want to use something that shows up. Um, I know a lot of people use purple. Uh, if the student has written in pencil or black pen, you want to use a contrasting color. Green is also good. Um, but just be aware that the red pen conveys wrong, 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 wrong. Uh, Open Office and Microsoft Word are other ways that we can provide feedback to learners. Uh, this is a, an open office page, and you can see that I have marked the page. Um, you know, my, my highlight in blue is when I'm indicating to the learner that there's a word missing. 
Uh, if I do something with red, that's word choice. And then in this case, because the learner doesn't know, they've done, they've obviously looked this up. So they've found that, that in translation for mid-autumn, they came up with the word between as mid. And so I'm helping them with that term. Um, I'm letting them know that they don't have to quote because that's, this is a higher level learner. And then every month on the 15th, the moon is a full moon. So this is an opportunity for me to ask them to look at the structure of this sentence and see if there's a way that they could change it so that the writing is a little more polished. That's the kind of, um, of feedback that I can give that's going to make a difference in how polished this piece is. At a lower level, I would not write that. At a lower level, that sentence reads perfectly. Uh, notice that um, it looks like the 15th got, but I can, I can use my line out for the learners to help them see very quickly what words are not necessary. So this is a lot less intimidating to look at as long as I don't do a whole lot more than this because they've got my, my questions on the side and they've got my input on, in the text itself. Just gonna take a moment and see if there are any questions. OpenOffice is a free platform. Microsoft Word is not. The reason that I'm showing you OpenOffice rather than Microsoft Word, which has a very similar interface, is that learners can, can make use of this. Those of you that are working in libraries, learners do have access to computers in most libraries. Um, they may not have access to, uh, to Microsoft Word. If they don't, you might want to talk to the library about the idea of, of working with OpenOffice, which is used by um, all kinds of professional uh, organizations. It's not, it's not a wild and crazy app. And again, I have provided the links to both ways to find out about Microsoft Office and ways to find out about uh, Open Office. Oh, look, I came in closer. Who knew? And last but certainly not least, um, I want to talk about the final draft and publishing because these two really go together. Learners need to be able to keyboard in the 21st century. And if you can provide an opportunity for learners to take their piece and type it up, that is a great thing. If they can type it onto their cell phone, that's okay, but it's a, it's a little more of a challenge. The keyboarding becomes a little more of a challenge. And maybe again, I'm showing my age because it's a challenge for a 61 year old woman, but for a 20 year old, it may not be. The thumbs might just work really, really well. Um, but if you've got uh, a tablet at least that has something of a keyboard or a desktop computer or a laptop that the learner can use, even one laptop or one computer in the classroom would still allow learners to take time, take turns, rotations, typing up their material. Um, they, if they don't have access to a keyboard, they do have to have, in order to finalize, it has to be legible. So that would be an opportunity to talk about in the uh, editing stage, to talk about any issues that you see with handwriting or printing. Formatting skills are important for the publishing side of things. If someone is required to turn in, uh, let's say for a newsletter, or for Facebook post, you know, you don't want things to, um, you want the margins to be even, or you want the spacing to be uh, one and a half or two. You want to make sure that learners know how to make that formatting happen. So that becomes a digital skills lesson. Very important, very big part of WIOA and our English language proficiency standards, as well as the College of Who Readiness standards. Digital skills are key. Digital literacy, uh, is more about the reading side than the writing side, although we do want to encourage learners when we're writing for social media to be aware of the pitfalls of writing things that uh, they wouldn't want others to read. So we have to, that's digital literacy comes in in that way with writing. So we can set up publishing opportunities. Um, social media posts, as I mentioned, Facebook is a great, you can have a private Facebook group uh, that your class can post to. 
Um, you can have a PB Works Wiki that your class can, uh, can again, write to privately. Uh, you can have them do blogging. Um, the libraries, I, I looked this up to see if with the Florida libraries, particularly, you know, some of the Tampa or Orlando, I looked around to see whether they had newsletters and they do. So you could talk about uh, with your librarian, talk about whether you could get learner writing into the newsletter if you haven't already. Uh, the Change Agent, which I'll show you in a minute, and the Florida Literacy Coalition Essay Book are two brilliant ways to have the learners um, start publishing their work. The blogging, uh, as you can see over here, I've uh, shown you just a little bit of, of how a blog gets set up. Um, this is the WordPress blog, and it's very, very simple, and something that I think asks, asks for a lot of good language. So, you know, naming your site, telling what your site will be about. In this case, site is equal to blog, and then what are the goals you have? So just answering these questions is a great language opportunity. And then the learner sets up the blog. And there's no harm, no foul if the learner doesn't blog but once a year. I myself have a blog that I haven't blogged in since April of 2015, I think. And the last blog post was about Ace of Florida. So blogs can be difficult to keep up. But if, we, if you have a classroom blog, then learners can be contributing to that. The Change Agent is a wonderful uh, resource for getting learners' work published. Uh, it, it, the, the readings are a great model for your learners. And again, I have the, the link for that in the, the handout. But this is something to consider. Um, this is it's all student writing. And then, of course, we have the Florida Literacy Coalition uh, essay book. And that is another resource for learners and one I hope you'll all be taking advantage of. Uh, I've seen in the essay book learners at the beginning level contributing, contributing uh, short personal narratives, uh, process essays, and there's so many opportunities for learners at all levels. Remember too that if you have a literacy, beginning literacy level learner, the language experience approach where you use a picture and the learner either uses his or her smartphone to dictate the story or dictates the story to you. And then together with your learner, you work on that story, both as a route towards reading and writing effectively. That's another option for your lowest level learners. I want to show you a couple of other tools. This is something called Storybird. Um, with Storybird, you pick a picture. Uh, the learner can pick a picture. You can pick it together. Uh, and then uh, I, you also get to pick your cover, which is nice. So if I wanted to choose this cover. Um, I spend a lot of time on the covers, more than on the printing, uh, on the uh, writing. But once I've, once I've picked a cover, then I can uh, pick my picture. I mean, I'm sorry. Pick my picture, and then I can start writing about my picture. And you can see that in here is where I would write. Me is surrounded by writing materials. At the end, there is you have a, a uh, an ebook. And I, if I were really like um, Julia Child, I would be able to show you this ebook at the end, but I'm not. So <laughs> take my word for it. You have an ebook that you can print. For a price, but that you can also, uh, with your account, can stay online. Now, Storybird has uh, an account for educators, so you can, uh, if you have more than one student, you can have them sign into your uh, your account, and then all the books are on one account. Uh, I want to. Oh, okay, it's asking me. I'm going to leave. I also wanted to share with you that I uh, there are many, many, many sites that have graphic organizers for free, and these are all downloadable. Uh, uh, as PDFs. Remember that graphic organizers are very useful for uh, your work uh, at, with pre-planning, with planning and organizing the material, but they're also a great resource after the fact, after you've written to go back in and see, do you have the, the, the outline of a good story or a good essay? 
So for example, here's a great one with a newspaper article planner. Uh, and if I had done a different type of graphic organizer to set up the article, then once they'd written the article, I would see if they could transfer the information back here. That's just an idea. You can see that there are so many. And again, you don't want to use all of these. You want to choose one that is appropriate for the work that and the topic that you're doing. And those that I've mentioned in this webinar are probably the ones that you'll find most useful initially. Venn diagrams for uh, comparing and contrasting, uh, KWL charts for uh, research, um, looking at uh, outlines and sequences for process. Now, sometimes as an instructor, I want a quick answer to a question that I have about writing. And so for today, I wrote in here uh, in my um, URL bar, I wrote how to end an essay. Because I was hoping for lots of different ideas on ways you could end an essay. Now, if I go to Pinterest, I could write that and I would also get all of these posters on ways to end an essay. Um, the Harvard Writing Center points out the importance of looking at different writing centers for ideas on teaching writing. This is a tremendous strategy for us as instructors. But if I go to the, um, I thought you might enjoy the wiki how, which tells you a set of ideas. And so this actually provides us with a mini lesson for our learners. And one of the things that I thought was very interesting was, they suggest not using these three terms. Where I, in my ESL brain, was thinking, I want, I want classic terms that my learners could use. But they're saying that using these terms is rather trite. So that's something that, that I wouldn't necessarily have in my back pocket. Um, I, would, I would be thinking, oh, I should teach my students to say to summarize or in closing. But in fact, what I want to look at is, say, is to see what are the terms that they're looking for now. And one of the things that they suggest is um, listing uh, a quote, um, briefly summarizing the main point. So they, they have a whole other way of looking at this. And I want to point to that as being an important strategy for writing instructors, is to look and see, Google a question, and look and see what many different people have to say about that question. Penzu is another tool. It's more of a journaling uh, tool, but in order to be good writers, our, writer, our learners need the writing habit. Uh, so here's an example uh, I started yesterday um, of an ESL journal, and I get to, because I'm not paying for anything, I get to choose my font, I don't get to choose my background. Uh, and then I write my goal, and then every day it comes up with a little reminder to me that I can, I can, write, a, I can write an entry. This is something that has a mobile app as well, so learners could be reminded to write something. Remember that using that microphone tool, they can also record something and go back in later and edit it. So let me check with you and see what are some things that you're taking away. In the question panel, would you please type one thing that you're gonna be able to take away from uh, from our time today. Sorry, something just popped in that should not have popped in. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that. I'm kind of hoping you didn't. Um, so in the, the question panel, if you could write one thing that you're taking away from our time together. It could be, boy, I knew a lot of this already. <laughs> but hopefully not so much that. And Nicole, could you tell me if you're seeing anybody typing? Uh, yeah, it does seem like some people are typing right now. Okay. For those of you that are not typing, let me just say that asking your learners to provide some sort of feedback on what, they, what they're taking away from a lesson is very valuable for them. It identifies what they've learned in that time period and how their time has been spent. But it's also very valuable for you. And if you use it as a writing exercise with a frame, one thing I learned today is, one question I have is, 
uh, right now I'm feeling one person I want to thank is, especially in a classroom setting. It'd be very hard if you wrote that as a tutor because they'd always want to thank you. Okay, you got uh, a couple of responses now. Uh, actually, quite a few okay. responses coming in. Okay, so is there a reason why I wouldn't be seeing them, do you think? Um, do you have the questions box open? I do. Um, can, there's a little um, symbol that says undock the pane from control panel. Have you done that? Mm -hmm. I have. Okay. I'm not sure why you're not seeing them. I'll go ahead and, and run through them, okay? Perfect. All right. So some of the uh, takeaways I'm seeing here are links and printables, uh, writing idea resources, um, online resources I could give to volunteer tutors to help their learners with teaching writing, um, great references. Um, let's see. It seems like uh, someone didn't have uh, one, one of the links didn't work for uh, for someone, but uh, what? Uh, for the Google Doc, but you know what I could do is I could send that to everyone in a follow-up email as well. Perfect. Um, we've got the importance of pre-writing and drafting. Um, resources. Um, someone says, I will put um, into practice a lot of the pre-writing strategies since my students are really low learners. Also, I like the strategies in general. Um, the use of scaffolding and writing process. Um, let's see, more uh, the strategies in general, um, organizational skills, um, the uh, tools and resources you provided, uh, use of visual prompts, uh, links and references, and the drafting and revising. Well, great. I'm sorry that you had to read them all, Nicole, but thank you very much. And I think it's it's important it's important to how to know what people were saying actually for all of us to hear it because you wouldn't have been able to see all of it anyway. Um, it's, sure. it's uh, yeah, yeah, so that's great. So it sounds like uh, no big surprise that one of the things that that we value as instructors is access to resources. Uh, so I I can't emphasize enough the value of asking the question in the uh, URL board uh, bar. If there's ever something you need, um, if you you might have to figure out how to frame the question, but I have found tremendous resources just by asking or prompting uh, Google to to give me uh, frames for ESL writers or best models for um, comparative essay. So that kind of uh, tech tool is something that we could never have imagined in 1970 unless we were deep 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 in the bowels of a research library and even then we probably wouldn't have found it so there's there's a lot that's being posted I want to encourage all of you as you're developing models and frames and resources for your learners to be posting them either on a Google folder for your in your program or in some way that you can share because as you could see just from the takeaway feedback we're all looking for the best possible way to help our learners become better writers and for us to become better instructors in doing that. So, I, and I think you've, you've proven that you have that gene <laughs> just by being here today. Um, I was going to ask you uh, to mark your response on a poll about what you can do now, but we were so far um, up on, uh, on all of these things that I, I think I won't take your time with the poll, but I hope that that those of you that didn't have a, a strong sense of the writing process can now realize that pre-writing comes first and then is followed by drafting, but drafting, pre-writing go back and forth, revising the draft and sometimes going back to drafting, and that editing is really what you're doing prior to going into the finalizing of the written material. And that publication is very important because publication is when that author's voice is heard by more people. Um, it's terrific for you to read, it's terrific for the peers, the learner's peers to read, but it's even better for that voice to become more public uh, and for that learner to, to get that pump up. So with that, I wanna thank you so much for your participation today, and I wish you the happiest of holidays and a healthy and peaceful 2018.
Thank you everyone for participating today. Um, you will receive a follow-up email today um, with a survey. I ask that everyone please uh, fill that survey out. Um, you will also get the links in that email as well uh, via a Hightail link and a certificate of completion. Um, and thank you so much. And uh, don't forget to visit our website, www.floridaliteracy.org, uh, to see this webinar and um, all past webinars on our website. Um, it will likely be up on YouTube a lot faster than it'll be up on our website. So you can also check our YouTube channel that has um, all of our webinars along with other uh, videos, helpful videos. So uh, thank you all so much for your participation, and I look forward to emailing you soon. Bye.